Welcome to Aerodynamics. In the previous lecture, we have uh, talked about uh, the kinematics of an aircraft motion. We talked about the three linear, uh, principal linear motions and the three principal uh, rotational motions. So um, let's just um, revise those really quickly. Let's look at each individually. The rotation about lateral axis is called pitch. This movement changes the vertical direction of the aircraft's nose. The rotation about normal axis is called yaw. This is the movement of the nose of the aircraft from side to side. The rotation about the longitudinal axis is called roll. This is the movement of the aircraft's wings. One wing goes up, the opposite wing goes down. So in summary, these are the three principal axes of movement. Right. Um... So now if you retake an aircraft, it has a center of gravity. And you'll see that it has the main wings centered around the close to the center of gravity. And then you'll see that the auxiliary wings um, are farther away, actually are at the farthest point away from the center of gravity uh, towards the end of the airplane. And the reason why is that is that that distance gives you a moment arm to generate um, sufficient moments. So typically you'd like your primary wing, This you would like the center of pressure, that is the point um, uh, that describes the action point um, of the forces generated by uh, the main wing to be close to the center of gravity or the center of mass um, of the airplane. So typically your center of pressure will probably be somewhere uh, somewhere here and you only have a little shift uh, along any of those axes from, uh, from the center of gravity. So you'll have one on each wing uh, and the shift, the net of the net um, between the two wings has a small shift and then you can count so that creates a moment uh, but a small moment about the center of gravity and then um, you can control the net moment around the center of gravity by these auxiliary surfaces um, so to talk about the motion dynamics um, we have for the uh, main forward motion the the thrusters the engines um, so that's how we control the forward motion is by uh, generating thrust in in the engine. Now for the lateral and the vertical motions we don't have thrusters that can help us uh, and we have to rely on uh, the rotational motions that is the yaw and uh, the pitch and uh, we will talk about how to uh, bring about those uh, yawing and um, pitching motion and also the rolling motion. So let's say now um, you want to take off or land. Uh, what you do, let's say we, uh, you have, uh, let's say we want to, to take off. We have those um, horizontal stabilizer uh, surfaces. So they generate um, a net lift force. And also you have uh, the um, um, the elevator, uh, this surface, which uh, can um, change the direction of that force. So we can have the net force to uh, point down or to point up. So now imagine that you're pushing down, so you're creating a lift that pushes down on the wing, um, uh, pushes down on the tail of the aircraft that creates a moment uh, that causes 
the airplane to uh, pitch around the y-axis right so it rotates around the y-axis so that lifts the nose of the airplane and same idea if you uh, push upwards so you can um, this lifting surface the um, elevator you can control it to create a positive lift or a negative lift uh, depending on whether you want to take off or uh, land so that way you can turn the nose of the airplane up or you can turn the nose of the airplane uh, down um, and similarly if you want to um, to um, yo left or right so to move uh, in the lateral direction uh, you have now the z-axis you can create a positive lift perpendicular to the surface so the lift forces we're talking about are perpendicular to these um, to the horizontal stabilizer and to the vertical stabilizer so they can be positive or negative lift forces um, and when you do that so let's say if you create a lift force to the left then um, you're, you're pushing the the tail of the airplane to the left then you cause it to rotate about the center of gravity around the uh, z-axis so you cause it to yo to uh, it will turn the nose will turn in this direction uh, so these are the primary motions on how um, to generate the the linear vertical motion and uh, the linear lateral motion. So we generate them through the um, the angular um, through angular control of the kinematics. And now, uh, so the lifting surfaces is what helps us uh, do all that uh, type of control. Now there is one last um, mechanism for uh, controlling. Um, the angular motions without um, depending on the lifting surfaces and that's through the thrusters so uh, these thrusters these two thrusters the, if they generate a the same lift they're not or the same thrust uh, excuse me uh, they're not going to create any moment about the center of gravity but if they generate um, different thrusts so they will end up generate so if this thruster um, creates a thrust force that is larger than this than the uh, this particular thruster then you're going to um, to create a yawing motion so the aircraft will tend to turn to um, to your right uh, in this direction and at the same time um, you can imagine that it's going to go in a curved path and when it's doing that that curved path will have uh, a radius of curvature and uh, essentially uh, it has an angular speed so with your v squared over r uh, you're going to get a higher effective speed on the outer wing than on the inner wing so you can slightly generate more lift on this on 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 the outer wing than on the inner wing so you also uh, can cause through the thrusters the differential thrust you can generate a uh, rolling motion um, so the aircraft will roll in this pattern for um, this particular configuration of a differential thrust and this is becoming uh, more uh, more of an interest with um, when you have multiple thrusters if you want um, to um, to control a micro air vehicles um, so if you need want to look at further reading you can look uh, at this thesis um, so um, we have all these surfaces that create uh, local so we have the um, the rudder we have the elevator and we have the main wing that create local lift forces that are perpendicular to the particular uh, wing 
But if I'm looking at the aircraft, there are two primary forces that I do care about. One is the um, lift force that counteracts my weight, and uh, it's specifically designed or defined as the force perpendicular to the direction of motion um, or the U infinity that we've talked about last time. And then you have the drag force, which is parallel, but in an, it, uh, it's directed in an opposite uh, orientation to the um, U infinity. So it drags on the airplane. So yeah, I'd like you to remember those two things, the perpendicular, perpendicularity of lift to the motion, so U infinity, it's relative to this particular and um, term, the U infinity, and the drag is parallel to the direction of U infinity, not to the surface itself, but to the direction of motion of the aircraft. And now um, you can have actually the lift force acts in a plane. It doesn't um, the lift force that we care about that count counteracts the weight uh, or g the gravity force. Uh, is pointing in the Z direction, but uh, for an aircraft we can have um, the lift force to be pointing anywhere in the Y uh, Z plane. Uh, so you can have side lift, vertical lift, or anywhere uh, in between. So the lift, all these are lift forces, lift in the Y, uh, but these are called side lifts. And if we're the um, uh, the weight of the aircraft is only carried by the vertical component of the lift along the Z direction. But keep in mind that when you're maneuvering, you have side lift forces too. Um, or, all right. And now we, we are interested in, uh, so we said that all these surfaces, these lifting surfaces which have uh, an aerofoil section are responsible for generating these um, aerodynamic forces, lift and drag. And when you're generating a lift and you're multiplying it by um, by uh, an arm length of, of the action, uh, the moment arm, um, then you're generating also a rolling or pitching or yawing motion. Uh, you're generating a rotational motion. Uh, and we would like now to know, to delve deeper into what is really, what is it in the motion of the air around the wing that causes um, the wing to generate a force, um, a positive lift or a negative lift force? Um, so we would like to get to the bottom of it. What is the source or the origins of these lift forces on uh, on a wing? And by a wing, we we start. We now talking um, of an airfoil section. So to describe any of those wings, whether we're talking about the main wing or we're talking about the rudder, or we're talking about the um, the elevator. So let's revise our. Uh, fluid mechanics uh, course and if you yeah, I'm sure all of you now are so now let's look at the airfoil you have um, the leading edge and that's your trailing edge so um, someone sitting on the wing sees the wind coming uh, in this direction and at this velocity uh, u infinity and um, the wing itself has, a, as we said, has a leading edge and a trailing edge. So the the first point that touches the um, the wind, and the last point that uh, that uh, the point that last sees the the incoming wind. Uh, and if you draw a line between those two, that's called the chord line. And um, we will come to this later. Uh, the angle between the chord line and between the U infinity. So that's the chord line here, and that's your U infinity. This angle is called the angle of attack.
uh, of that wing. And it doesn't have to be uh, just the pitching angle of attack. If we go to um, one of those previous slides, um, there is an angle of attack for this wing. Over here, it's, uh, it's a better picture. There's an angle of, of attack for this wing, an angle of attack for this wing, and an angle of attack for uh, for this wing. So we, we're talking about any of those um, any of those lifting surfaces. The story is the same. You have a leading edge, you have a trailing edge, uh, you have an angle of attack um, that is made between the cord line and between the incoming uh, flow direction. And you have the orthogonal um, the orthogonal uh, coordinate system x, y, and z. So in this particular case, we're looking at the x, y plane. So our our cross section is in the x, y plane. But we could be looking at a y, z, or an x, z, uh, easily at any of those directions. Um, so now let's. If I'm interested, so there is a net force generated on uh, this wing by the passage. Uh, of the air around it and I would like to know what is the source of it so I would now look in more detail at the wing so I will look at a very tiny elemental area here it's zoomed in so I'm gonna take a small elemental area uh, DA and look at what forces are acting on it and I will first see that there is actually a pressure force a static pressure force um, that's acting on the wing that's trying uh, that is compressive, that is, it's pointing towards the wing, and it's perpendicular to the area. And I will notice also that there is a parallel force, uh, parallel to the area, so here I've drawn it, I'm still talking about the same area, but I've picked a different region so that uh, to unclutter my, my figure. There's a parallel force, which is the viscous shear force, um, uh, or the viscous shear stress um, that acts parallel, that's due to viscosity, that acts parallel to, uh, to the direction of motion. So now these are the two fundamental um, forces that create um, the lift and drag on my aircraft on, or on a particular, uh, or on a particular uh, wing. So um, now if I know what the shear stress and the pressure on each and every uh, piece of the wing, if I break the wing into an infinite uh, number of those D areas dA, um, and then I sum them up and uh, look at the x direction or the y direction, so look at the component in the u infinity direction, that is my drag force, and look at the component perpendicular to the U infinity, that would be my uh, lift force. So U infinity is our reference for defining, the direction of U infinity is our reference for defining the lift and um, drag forces. Not the area of the wing, uh, not this DA, because you see the DA um, changes direction between the, f uh, between the leading edge and the trailing edge um, it can be perpendicular here, or it can be parallel, perpendicular. Uh, so here it could be perpendicular to the U infinity. In this region, it's parallel to U infinity. So the the area itself changes direction. So you want to keep that in mind when um, when you look when you're solving problems and trying to understand. And the shear stress comes from uh, what um, primarily from the no slip condition. Um, so, if you remember from your fluid mechanics course, a uh, fluid element that's in touch with a solid object would have the same velocity uh, as the solid object. And the evidence for this, the empirical evidence, the laboratory evidence for this is. Um, um, is well accepted uh, that the flow does not does not slip. Uh, maybe at micro and nanoscales there are slippage velocities, but for us um, dealing with aerodynamics, 
uh, macro systems that doesn't uh, affect us very much. And what causes the pressure? Uh, as we will see, it's a Bernoulli pressure. It's, it comes from the um, from the the streamline pattern. So a change in the streamline pattern and the pattern of the flow direction and velocity around the wing uh, in turn turns into a uh, pressure. Um, so these are the two primary sources of uh, these are the two fundamental sources, origins for the aerodynamic forces. The shear stress, which comes from viscosity, from the no-slip condition, um, and the pressure that comes from the velocity variation, from the velocity variation around uh, the wing. How to compute them? Um, that's another story. But let's assume that we have them now. We have the pressure distribution around the wing. We have the shear stress distribution around the wing. And now I want to get the net force due to sh due to shear and uh, in the vertical and horizontal direction. So I get the shear components of the uh, drag and the lift forces. And I also do the same thing. I sum up all the pressure forces in a vectorial summation and get the component perpendicular to infinity. That would be my lift uh, component of the pressure. And I get the parallel, um, parallel component, which would be my uh, drag component uh, due to pressure. So let's do that in a little bit more detail, what, what I've just said. So here I have my top, my wing. It has a top surface, so it's from the leading edge to the trailing edge. And if I complete the circle, I would also have a lower surface. So I will do, I will do the analysis in two steps, um, top surface and then bottom surface and then sum everything um, up. So this is my area DA and my... Um, uh, and this is my coordinate system X and Y. I've, I now have my wing uh, inclined. Um, my wing is inclined. So you see, if you draw a line from the trailing edge to the leading edge, we have an inclination angle alpha. It's different than this theta that we have over here. The theta, um, the theta we will come to it. Uh, so the wing is inclined relative um, to the wind direction and X and Y are my primary uh, coordinate system with U infinity in the X direction uh, and it's also perpendicular to, to the Y. So let's take this area DA. The area DA um, makes an angle theta with the, X, uh, with the X axis. So if I have to draw the area DA over here the, or the angle theta, it would be so. It's measure, the angle theta is measured from um, the x-axis um, in the counterclockwise direction. So actually, if I want to be uh, accurate, I have to erase this. So my angle theta is this. This would be my theta. You go in the counter from in the x direction in a counterclockwise um sense to uh, the line you're you're looking at so this is my my theta uh, but for um so that's basic um geometric uh, basic geometry okay so now let's look at the top surface of the wing on on that area da um i have a pressure force I have a pressure stress, which is P, uh, at this particular location X and Y. So this is X and Y uh, measured from my origin, which is, uh, which is here. Uh, that's my X and Y. And the, uh, the elemental area has an area DA. And the magnitude of the pressure at this point, as we said, the pressure is compressive and perpendicular always. Um, that's what it is, the static pressure. The magnitude of it is P. So now, um, 
if I want to get the force, that's a stress. If I want to get the force, I multiply those two, the area and the pressure. So that's the, the force perpendicular to the area DA is PDA. And the force parallel, which is due to the shear stress, the wall shear stress, tau wall, um, is tau DA. Um, and now uh, I can, so the pressure force, PDA, has a component along the y direction and a component along the x direction. The component along the y direction we're going, it's called lift because it's uh, perpendicular to infinity. And along the x direction, it's called uh, drag um, uh, if it is in the opposite direction. Um, or, or is it called thrust if it's in, in, in the same motion direction as the wing. So the, if to in this direction, it will be called thrust because it's pushing the, the wing to move against uh, the wind. Um, so I can break or I can um, project my pressure force and shear, my, and shear force onto the x and y axis so I can uh, project them into lift and drag forces. So let's do that. So let's take the top surface and then we will do the bottom surface. So for the top surface, um, I have uh, the X component of the shear stress, uh, which is uh, a drag force. So that shear stress, uh, the shear stress originally is parallel to the area, but here it's, um, I take its component parallel to the X direction. So I get um, F tau in the X um, projection and also the F tau in the, in the Y projection. And do the same thing for the pressure force. I get the pressure force projected in the X and in the Y direction. And they all depend on what the orientation of the surface uh, is with the X, with the coordinate system. So um, you can do the projections if that's my inclination angle. This is my uh, theta. So here I have PDA cosine theta um, that uh, gives me the Y PDX cosine or PDA cosine theta that gives me the Y component um, of the pressure force. So you see now uh, the shear stress has an x. Com the shear stress force is an x and y component, and the pressure uh, force has an x and y component. And we've done the top part of the wing. We do the bottom part of the wing. It's the exactly same story. And then we uh, sum them all up to get. Uh, if I'm now interested in the lift and drag, which which is most of the time what I'm interested in, then I sum the x components together and I sum the y components uh, together. And those x component and y component can be of viscous origin or of static pressure uh, origin. So these are the origins of the, um, of the aerodynamic forces and naturally the aerodynamic moments. Um, so now, I have summed up all the X components. As we've said, they contribute to the drag. Uh, that's the drag force, D. Um, so you sum up all the forces on the top of the wing, the bottom of the wing, uh, due to shear and due to pressure. Um, so here, because you have tau, this part of the drag, we call it friction drag. And this is pressure, P. This part of the uh, of the drag is called the pressure drag. And same thing you do, uh, you sum up uh, the uh, components of uh, pressure and shear forces uh, in the y direction that is perpendicular to infinity, and you get the lift force. And again, the lift force has uh, shear stress component and a pressure component. And um, from experience, the shear stress component contribution to lift 
is pretty much negligible. So primarily from now on, we're going to ignore the uh, shear stress contribution to lift, and we're only going to consider the pressure contribution to, um, to lift. Um, the opposite is not, through, is not true though. Uh, looking at the drag uh, force, you have friction, uh, drag, which is due to viscosity, to the viscous stress, but also you have pressure drag. And most of the time, in, you can have your pressure drag to be actually much larger than your uh, friction drag. Uh, that is the, um, the non-streamlining, if, if your aircraft were non-streamlined uh, or it's maneuvering in a way, it can create a lot of pressure drag. Uh, but shear stress is, for all practical purposes, has little contribution to the lift force. But the drag has both both components, friction and pressure, are uh, important. So now the, um, the question is, so now if, if I give you the pressure distribution and the shear stress distribution over the wing, uh, then you can get, get me the lift and drag. But really, if we try and dig deeper, how do I get this pressure distribution? And how do I get this um, um, shear stress distribution over the surface of the wing? Then we have to dig deeper into the fluid mechanics and the aerodynamics of, um, of the flow around the wing. Because you see, you have the wind or air is coming and um, interacting with this geometry. It comes in and splits to the top side and the bottom side. Uh, and we can do all types of analyses that we have done in fluid mechanics, like control volume analysis, or um, even solving the, the Navier-Stokes equation uh, to try and uh, understand uh, the flow behavior about the wing. And if I can understand the flow, the Navier-Stokes equ equation, if I, if I am able to solve it, um, it will um, produce for me the pressure distribution of the, over the wing or the shear stress distribution over the wing. The other way uh, is to go to the lab and put shear stress sensors over the surface of the wing and also put pressure sensors over the surface of the wing so you can get the pressure distribution over the surface of the wing. Uh, but if I, if we want a simple explanation, simpler than um, going to the complex Navier-Stokes equation, as to what is the basic, what is the most the um, more most fundamental contributor to the pressure distribution and to the wall shear stress distribution, then we can have uh, that would be the topic of aerodynamics in in this course, and that's what we would like to um, to do. We don't want to do the Navier-Stokes equation because that readily that will definitely that will give us the wall shear stress distribution and will give us the pressure distribution. We want a, um, and that's a complex answer. We want a simpler answer that we can um, that we can use very quickly um, to be able and be able to predict the performance of this particular uh, wing. And now that uh, we've mentioned uh, this particular wing, um, the wing has a shape and has a cross section. And that shape um, will um, decide what the distribution of the DA is and will decide what the distribution of the inclination. You know, if you had a wing like so, um, for example, you will have the inclination of each uh, point on the wing relative to the x-axis to vary, and that will also vary uh, the, the uh, contribution of the shear stress and the pressure to the drag and lift. So now, you'd like to keep this idea in your head is that the shape of the wing um, does two things. One, it changes the contributions due to the sine and cosine, but also it actually does 
um, impact the airflow around the wing and in turn that it also impacts the component of the wall shear stress and the component of the pressure and this is what we're going to talk about next is um, how is this uh, or um, in, a, in a more basic term a basic um, approach um, the effect of the wind flow uh, or the, in, in generating the pressure and wall shear stress. So I'm um, going to give you a quick answer to the pressure part of the um, of the force generation and that is the Bernoulli pressure. That's the dynamic head if you remember from your fluid mechanics. Pressure has units of Pascal and density has units of kilogram uh, per meter cubed, right? And the velocity has units of meter per second and then you square it. And now if you check this, you're going to get a Pascal. So uh, you look at the units of uh, kilogram meter. So if you take one of those meters in the square and you take the kilogram meter per second square, so you're left with still a meter over here. Um, so kilogram meter per second square, and then you're left with a meter here. That meter goes with the meter cubed. So you get a newton here and you get a meter square. And that's your Pascal. So uh, unit wise, Newton per meter square. So just looking at the units, um, those two are equivalent, and uh, what gener and the Bernoulli pressure, the Bernoulli dynamic pressure, is what is responsible for generating my the static pressure over my wing. Well, what is causing the shear stress? Well, the sh what's causing the shear stress is in its basic origin is the no-slip condition that we have just uh, mentioned uh, moments ago. Um, you have a zero, if you look at the velocity, so now if I um, take a small tiny region just touching the surface of the wing and I just zoom it up, which is right over here, and I, look, I try to look at the velocity distribution, I see that my velocity is zero at the surface of the wing, uh, that is relative to the wing. The velocity of the air is zero at the surface of the wing, and then it increases um, until it gets to you infinity, um, a few millimeters away from the surface of the wing. And this region where this change happens is called the boundary layer. But the point that I wa was making is that um, the this point uh, in the fluid particle, the air particle, air molecule uh, or packet that's just right in, in direct contact with the surface of the wing has zero velocity due to the no-slip condition which is um, um, which there is evidence for it in, in the um, in laboratory uh, as well as in field experiments. Um, and now, how does this generate wall shear stress? Well, wall shear stress is related to the gradient of the velocity at the wall. So that's uh, that's my velocity u, um, and y is the direction perpendicular to um, to the wing. Um, then the gradient of the velocity at the wall is the strain rate and you multiply that by viscosity you get the wall shear stress and just need to remind you that this y is not necessarily this same y so um, uh, they, they don't have to be the same um, the same y so keep that uh, keep that in mind but the origin of the wall shear stress is due to the velocity variation in the boundary layer so now we have the two more fundamental sources of um, of aerodynamic force generation the pressure uh, term and the wall shear stress term pressure term comes from Bernoulli 
wall shear stress term comes from this training, the stretching and um, of the fluid layers uh, due to the presence. Uh, so they're, they're being strained and sheared because far away you have the air is moving freely and right at the wing uh, they're not allowed to move at all. So in between, so here it's moving really fast at U infinity and here and at the surface of the wing it's not allowed to move so you're creating a sort of a strain on on the air um, creating a difference in velocity that's a strain or a strain rate and you multiply that by viscosity you get a wall shear stress um, and if you want to go and ask why and you want to go deeper into how wall shear stress uh, is related to the strain rate then you need to go and study the topic of rheology. So we will take this as our, which we won't do in this course. We have done that in fluid mechanics. Uh, but um, if you're interested in, in this a little bit more, you can study rheology and um, uh, it will tell you how the um, strain rate and viscosity um, act to give you wall shear stress and sometimes it's a nonlinear relationship but for air from now on we're going to consider it to be a newtonian fluid so the viscosity the dynamic viscosity that is has is um is a constant only varies with with temperature but doesn't vary with how fast the flow is moving or with the strain rate more accurately um let's look at the units again for the wall shear stress it's a stress so it has units of pascal or newton per meter square viscosity has, the dynamic viscosity actually has units of pascal second pascal dot second which is um if i remember correctly it's a kilogram per meter second so the viscosity has units of kilogram per meter second and then you multiply that uh, by the strain rate, the velocity you has units of meter per second, and the dy has units of, or the y. So the d is a is a is an operator that's unitless. It's a it's a differentiation. It's a limit. It doesn't have any units. Um, in its basic concept, it's a limit as something goes to zero. Um, so the D doesn't have any units, uh, it's only the U, so you, the units come only from the U and the Y, Y has units of uh, meter, so the meter goes with the meter. So you have Pascal dot second divided by second, so you get units of Pascal. But if you want, if you want it to be more, um, to go through this path, the viscosity has kilogram uh, per meter dot second, and the strain rate has units of one over second as we've um, just noted here so let's see you get um, and then you get so let's do one more manipulation um, you do a meter here so we'll just multiply all this with one so I get kilogram second square kilogram per second square and then multiplied by meter so i get kilogram meter per second square that's my newton and then divided by meter square so that gives me uh newton per meter square that's a pascal so again the units uh the units check um so this slide is really the introductory slide to what we are going to do in this uh, aerodynamics course. Uh, in this aerodynamics course, we are going to, you'll see the book also is broken into uh, part one and part two. In part one, uh, we will talk about the boundary layer theory. And the boundary layer theory is what uh, helps us understand the relationship between the wall shear stress uh, the um, uh, strain rate and the viscosity for different types of um, of wings, uh, and we are going to really focus on a wing that is on that is just a flat plate, 
um, because we are not going to delve in detail into the boundary layer theory. And by the way, uh, as you can see from the previous, as you saw in the previous slide, the boundary layer theory was perfected by Mr. Prantill and um, he showed evidence of its presence and he really helped um, uh, to modernize the study of aerodynamics and he he's instrumental in, in helping us um, uh, fly safely um, through the atmosphere uh, today. Um, and so that's part, uh, the first part of the book, it talks about uh, the boundary layer theory that helps us understand the behavior of the shear stress. And this part two of the book uh, is the potential flow theory. And in the potential flow theory, um, we're simplifying the flow into non-inviscid, and when your flow is inviscid and doesn't have any shear, then Bernoulli applies. And then you can relate your pressure distribution to the velocity distribution around uh, the wing. So for the second part of our course, we're going to be we're going to focus on how to find this velocity distribution over the wing, um, and it will depend on the shape of our uh, wing. If I can look at this, if I can predict what the shapes of the streamlines are, uh, then I that will help me predict what the velocity is, and then that will help me predict what the pressure distribution is. And now that I have my pressure distribution from the potential flow theory, and I have my wall shear stress distribution over the surface of the wing from the boundary layer theory, I can just go back to uh, my um, projection or decomposition of my lift and drag forces into friction and pressure drags and I can get my aerodynamic forces and I'm home free. So this is the story of MEC 516 or aerodynamics that we will be um, that we will that we have just started and we will be uh, discussing in further detail as we move forward in uh, this course. So I, I do hope that you uh, spend a moment and, and, and stop here and just go back and revise what we've just um, talked about. And just to summarize, um, we have the on an object, so later on we could uh, in our papers, uh, we, we're not only dealing with airplanes and aerodynamics, you have cars going through the air, you know, um, race cars, you have animals going through the air, um, sports, balls, and so on. Uh, so you want to think not just of an airplane, but we took that as an introductory example, uh, but not necessarily to be the only example that we are going to consider. We're going to consider other uh, shapes. And because deviating from the airfoil shape will help us get better understanding uh, as to the behavior of the air as it moves around different types of shapes. But in any of those, um, this is the basic picture. You have one, you have the object itself. Um, and then you have uh, someone sitting on the object they will see that the air is coming towards them. So this object is again the airplane, bird, ball, whatever. Um, someone sitting on the object will see that the wind is coming towards them at U0 or U infinity. Uh, we interchangeably use U0 or U infinity. Um, they mean the same thing. Uh, and it means um, that we have discussed um, in the previous lectures. Um, and the lift force is the force perpendicular to this U-infinity, 90 degree, and the drag force is the force parallel to, um, to U-infinity. So the drag force acts on, on the airplane and it tries to slow it down because uh, the airplane is really moving in this direction. Um, and what are the sources of these lift and drag forces? the origins, 
stressor and shear stress. So this is pretty much the summary. So remember those terms, pressure and shear stress and lift and drag. Um, and now um, we will just um, take you back to your list of um, dimensionless numbers and we will write the lift and drag in dimensionless uh, form and as well as the shear stress these are the lift we have the lift coefficient it's just a dimensionless lift force so it's the lift force divided by um, a dynamic head multiplied by an area what area we will talk uh, we will talk about it in because uh, the area um, is defined based on the context whether we're talking about a car or whether we're talking about a wing or a ball so uh, don't worry right now but it's an area so for now let's just check the unit um, the lift force has units of Newton F lift has units of Newton the half is unitless the density is kilogram per meter cubed and the U infinity has units of meter per second and then the whole thing is squared and then you have the area has units of um, meter squared so let's see how what this simplifies to so kilogram uh, so let's see uh, that meter squared right so here I get meter uh, squared goes with the meter cubed so I still get a meter here and that meter goes with the square so I get a kilogram meter so that square has gone so I get kilogram meter per second square so that's a Newton this whole thing boils down to a Newton and here I have a Newton so I get the lift coefficient has units of one it's unitless um, just to revise um, our fluid mechanics information uh, then you have the drag force uh, or the drag so it's often reported as a dimensionless drag force which we call the drag coefficient so it's just a it's just a drag force divided by a dynamic head the half rho u square a Bernoulli pressure uh, multiplied by an area so pressure times area is a force same thing um, so these are forces now we look at the stresses we have the wall shear stress and we have the um, pressure stress or the pressure normal stress uh, so the wall shear stress we report it in a dimensionless format as a skin friction coefficient so it's just the tau wall divided by half rho u square and the pressure coefficient is just uh, any pressure point on the surface of the wing right that's the p minus the p infinity is the pressure far away um, where we're measuring u infinity so that's u infinity um, so the differential pressure divided by a dynamic head so we will we will so we want to familiarize ourselves with those dimensionless uh, coefficients because we will be using them a lot in our uh, aerodynamic course so that's your um, that's your uh, slide so in the next lecture um, we will uh, be talking about um, boundary uh, layer theory so thank you for your attention and um, stay tuned for the next lecture thank you